Skeletal muscles are obviously the name we give to the muscles that are attached to our bones, our skeleton. Uh, there are about 650 skeletal muscles in the body. Uh, these 650 skeletal muscles that are attached to our skeleton comprise about 40% of our body weight, uh, not quite half. Now, obviously, if somebody is more muscular, right, if they're at work out a lot, then their skeletal muscles make up a greater proportion of their body weight. And on the other hand, if somebody's a couch potato, then uh, their skeletal muscles make up a lesser percent of their body weight. What are the basic characteristics of muscles, uh, muscle cells specifically, that make up muscles? Muscle cells and muscles in general exhibit two important characteristics, excitability and contractility. Excitability is the capacity to generate an electrical current, an action potential. An action potential is an electrical signal, an electrical impulse, an electrical current. Now, are muscle cells the only cells that generate these electrical signals called action potentials? No. So do nerve cells. So both muscle cells and nerve cells exhibit excitability the capacity to fire off an electrical signal. A second characteristic of muscle cells and muscles, which are made up of muscle cells, is contractility. The word contract means to shorten. It means to get shorter. So muscle cells and muscles that are made up of muscle cells have the capacity to get shorter, to contract. Now, nerve cells do not. So both nerve cells and muscle cells exhibit excitability. Muscle cells and muscles exhibit both excitability and contractility. What are the functions of our skeletal muscular system? And I wrote muscular, but it's really, I want to emphasize, we're talking about our skeletal muscles. Later, we're going to talk about the muscles in the organs of our body, like heart muscle. That's, that's something different. Uh, there are three major functions of our skeletal muscles in our body. Most significantly, they permit voluntary movement. Skeletal muscles, which we've learned, are innervated or controlled by somatic motor neurons, and we'll be talking more about that, allow voluntary control over the skeletal muscles in our fingers, in our arms, in our legs, and elsewhere in our body. This also includes uh, speech. Our vocal cords in our larynx or voice box are skeletal muscles that are under voluntary control. And we all have the capacity to change the tension on our vocal cords. And as we change the tension on our vocal cords, we change the pitch of our voice. It's very much like changing the tension on a guitar string or a violin string. As you change the tension, it changes whether it's a high pitch or a low pitch that comes out. That's under voluntary control. Those are skeletal muscles. And the most important of all of our skeletal muscles are the skeletal muscles we use for breathing. These are the most important of all skeletal muscles. These include the diaphragm muscle and the intercostal muscles. We've mentioned uh, both. The diaphragm muscle is, of course, the name of the muscle that separates our upper thoracic cavity from our lower abdominal pelvic cavity. We learned that on page A3, right? The diaphragm muscle, which separates in our ventral body cavity, separates our ventral body cavity as an upper thoracic or pleural portion and a lower uh, abdominal or peritoneal portion. The intercostal muscles. Now, uh, we had mentioned that the spaces between the ribs are called intercostal spaces. Intercostal literally means between the ribs. And the muscles between our ribs are called intercostal muscles. You know them better as the muscles, the meat that you eat on ribs. Uh, and they are used for breathing as well. These are the most important skeletal muscles. They just like, the skeletal, just like the skeletal muscles in our fingers are controlled by somatic motor neurons that are under voluntary control. Now, you, your first thought is, well, oh, I don't control my breathing. Sure you do. Watch. Stop!
go. All right, you can't do that with your heart. You can't do that with your stomach. You can't do that with your sweat glands. Now, you might say, yeah, but you can't hold your breath like it, you know, and kill yourself. That's right. We have in our brain what I call an idiot override. <laughs> so if you say, I'm going to hold my breath and kill myself, right, I'm just going to not breathe anymore. This is what little kids like to do when they're having a temper tantrum, right? They just <clears throat> <laughs> so there's at a certain point when the oxygen level drops enough in the bloodstream, the idiot override in the brain says, well, you're, you're an idiot. Okay, and it makes you breathe. Now, you might say, but, but wait a second, I'm still confused. Much of the time, when I'm breathing, I'm not consciously thinking about it. I'm going to come back to that point in just a moment. A second role of our skeletal muscles is maintaining body posture. You'd say, what does that mean? So right now, at this moment, all of you are more or less sitting in your chair. Okay, I don't care if you're slouching or not. You're sitting in a chair, I'm standing. Now, if you're just sitting in the chair, you're not moving, are you? I'm standing, I'm not moving. But just to maintain our posture, just to sit upright in the chair, you're using your skeletal muscles in your torso, in your back, just to sit upright. And even though I'm not walking, just for me to stand in one place, I'm using the muscles, the skeletal muscles in my legs. So just to maintain body posture. Now, uh, as you sit in the chair, or as I stand upright, are you thinking about using those muscles in your back right now? No. no. So in fact, you can actually think about the movement of your skeletal muscles, and you can move your back right now, or you could just not pay attention, and it can basically be controlled automatically for you. The same thing is true for uh, breathing. We can consciously think about breathing and speed up or slow down our breathing. <laughs> right? Or I could just not pay attention to my breathing, and it will be controlled automatically. So uh, we're, we're probably not going to get into this. You'll probably learn more about this in physiology. But there's actually two neural pathways that control the somatic motor neurons to your skeletal muscles. A voluntary neural pathway known as the pyramidal tract and an involuntary neural pathway known as the extrapyramidal tract. And they both can be used to control the, uh, our somatic motor neurons, which control our skeletal muscles. But um, all of our skeletal muscles can be initiated or activated both voluntarily or involuntarily. So the uh, breathing muscles, like the diaphragm, are not any different, really, than uh, the uh, muscles of your back. A third uh, role of our uh, skeletal muscles is heat production. And uh, the, when we use our skeletal muscles, uh, that increases the rate of cellular respiration in those muscle cells for the purpose of generating that gasoline molecule called ATP, which you have to know for the test, incidentally, on Wednesday. Uh, we talked about mitochondria and so on. So uh, uh, when we start to use our, our muscles, they start to, they need more gasoline, more ATP, and that speeds up the breakdown of sugars uh, with oxygen in the mitochondria of these cells, which generates a lot of heat. So that's why when you exercise, you get hot. But in fact, our body can take advantage of this. When we're chilled, when we're cold, uh, our skeletal muscles can be activated to start contracting simply for the purpose of generating heat. So if you're really cold uh, and you start, you're sitting on a cold bench outside and you don't have a sweater or a coat, and you say, oh, look, I'm, I'm so cold. I, I, look, I'm shivering. I'm, ooh, ooh, ooh. And as you contract those muscles, you're generating heat. Incidentally, the next time you're cold and start to shiver, you can stop shivering any time you want. You'd say, I can't. No, I'm cold. I'm shivering. I can't. How do I stop it? 
All that your brain wants you to do is to use your muscles, your skeletal muscles, to generate heat. You can either choose to do this voluntarily. You could say, I'm cold. I'm going to run in place. And because I'm going to run in place or do calisthenics, I will generate heat, and that will keep me warm. Or if you choose to sit on that bench and not move, uh, you have another idiot override in your brain. Your brain, if you don't voluntarily use your muscles to generate heat, you have a control center in your brain that says, you're an idiot. And it will automatically make those skeletal muscles start contracting for the purpose of generating heat. So you can either choose to do this voluntarily, or your brain will make you do it involuntarily. That's called shivering, but the purpose is you, uh, the, your body wants you to use those muscles to generate more heat to stay warm. Uh, let's look here at the gross structure of a skeletal muscle. Uh, right here it shows a, a typical muscle, skeletal muscle in the body. We know that the skeletal muscles are attached to our bones by tendons, TM. Remember, ligaments hold bones together, tendons attach muscles to bones. And the, typically, uh, a muscle is attached to two different bones. The bone that tends to remain stationary, that tends not to move, is known as the origin. So this would be known as, since there's a tendon that attaches to that bone, that's known as the tendon of origin. Uh, it also is known as the head or the seps. Seps is uh, short for cephalic, which means head. The actual muscle is called the belly of the muscle, and the other bone that the muscle is attached to uh, is known as the insertion. The insertion bone is the end that moves. That's the, uh, known as, the, since it's a, the muscle is attached by a tendon onto that bone, that's known as the tendon of insertion. It's also known as the tail. So you'll notice we have basically uh, the head, the belly, and the tail, as far as the way this muscle is laid out. The uh, head, or origin, or uh, seps, is where it, uh, the attachment that tends to remain stationary. The belly is where the muscle is. The insertion is the attachment to the bone uh, that moves. Now remember, all that a muscle does, that basically all that a muscle does is it shortens, it contracts. So when this muscle shortens or contracts, this end stays stationary, and it's, as this muscle contracts, it's going to pull on this bone, and it's going to pull this bone closer to that bone. Now this particular muscle is called the brachialis. We're going to be learning it. It's not one of the more important muscles, but it is a muscle we're going to learn. It's called the brachialis. It originates on the humerus, and it inserts on the ulna. Inserts on the ulna. So when this muscle contracts, which means to shorten, it pulls the ulna. It pulls the ulna closer to the humerus. All right? And in so doing, it causes bending or flexion at the elbow. So all it's doing is pulling the forearm closer to the upper arm. That's all that a muscle can do is it pulls the insertion closer to the origin. That's all that any muscle does. The tendons, of course, attach the muscle. And I wrote that they attach the muscle to the periosteum of the bone. And you'd say, well, what do you mean? This shows some skeletal muscle cells. And as we will be learning, skeletal muscle cells are highly unusual cells. They are very long cells that are multinucleated. They have lots of nuclei. They don't just have one nucleus. They have many, many nuclei. This is the tendon right here. Now, does anybody remember what kind of tissue makes up a tendon? Regularly arranged, dense, fibrous, connective tissue. We learned it on page D11. Remember, what does that tissue look like? It's made up of fibroblasts, and the collagen protein is all running in the same direction. So it's very strong. All right? This is the tendon. Now, we have learned, and we need to know, 
for the test that on the outer surface of every bone, there's a protective covering. What do we call that protective covering on the outer surface of a bone? The paraosteum. What tissue is the paraosteum made of? We learned it on D11. Regularly arranged, dense, fibrous, connective tissue. In other words, the tissue that makes up the tendon and the tissue that makes up the periosteum are identical. So literally, this tissue of the tendon merges. It fuses with the periosteum. They are the exact same tissue. So that's how a muscle is anchored onto a bone. Literally, the tendon and the periosteum are the same identical tissue. They fuse or merge with one another. All right, now we've uh, pointed out that uh, there's a tendon of origin and a tendon of insertion. The tendon of origin is known as the head or seps. That's the attachment to the, I wrote, less movable or stationary structure. And on page H2, Item number three, the tendon of insertion or tail is the attachment to the more movable structure, this structure that moves. Let's look at this picture here at the top left on page H2. On the top left on page H2, it shows a muscle. This muscle inserts on the radius. It inserts on the radius. That's the movable end. The radius is the end that moves. So that's called the insertion, or tendon of insertion. This particular muscle actually has two tendons of origin. Two tendons of origin. Both attachments are on the two different places of the scapula. Now, we had said that another name for the origin was the head or seps. Because this has two tendons of origin, two origins, it's called a biceps. And because it's in the upper arm, we learned on page A6 that the term, the anatomic term for upper arm is brachium. So this muscle is famously known as the biceps brachii muscle. What does this very famous muscle do? This muscle, all that a muscle can, can do, is pull the insertion closer to the origin. So it originates up here in the scapula. Let's uh, bring Mr. Skeleton Man here. It's originating on the scapula. It inserts on the radius, and it pulls on the radius. It pulls the radius closer to the scapula, and in so doing, it also causes bending or flexing at the elbow. Now, you might say, well, that brachialis you told us did that as well. That's right. So there's, we have more than one muscle that can cause certain movements. On the top of page H3, so the, the, what we want to address briefly is fascia. What the heck is fascia? We actually learned that term, fascia, originally on page uh, uh, D11. D11. You can check it. On D11, we were learning about regularly arranged and irregularly arranged dense fibrous connective tissue. And we said that fascia is this protective connective tissue covering each muscle. That's called fascia. So it's uh, very similar to the idea of the paraosteum, the protective covering around each bone. So there are actually three layers of fascia associated with each muscle. The epimyceum, the paramyceum, and the endomyceum. The epimyceum, and epi, of course, means on the top, on the top surface. On the outer surface surrounding each entire muscle is a layer of fascia, dense fibrous connective tissue, called the epimyceum. And in this picture, you can see it's labeled right here. It's on the outer surface. The paramyceum, circled right here on your right, this is a layer of fascia that is wrapped around a bundle of skeletal muscle cells. So around uh, covering the outer surface of an entire muscle is the epimyceum, 
And the paramycium, para of course means around, around a bundle of uh, many skeletal muscle cells is called the paramycium. And finally, the endomycium. Endo, of course, means inside, inner. Endomycium is a layer of fascia around each individual skeletal muscle cell. So surrounding each individual skeletal muscle cell or fiber is endomycium. Now let me remind you, of course, that uh, if these are connective tissues, these fascia, they are characteristically vascularized. There are blood vessels running within this connective tissue. Incidentally, let's review very briefly. Uh, dense fibrous connective tissue, what are the cells called? Fibroblasts. What do those fibroblasts secrete? Collagen. Here it shows a group, a bundle of skeletal muscle cells. The actual fascia has been removed from this bundle. But we can still see, and I colored it red, uh, a blood vessel, right? A blood capillary or uh, uh, carrying nutrients. So these uh, capillaries are carrying oxygen and nutrients to nourish these skeletal muscle cells and remove waste products. Also running within that fascia, not only are there blood vessels, there are neurons. Both sensory neurons and motor neurons are running within this fascia. So again, it's running within both the endomycium, the paramycium, and the epimycium. Here we've identified this particular neuron as a somatic motor neuron. Now, have we ever spoken about a difference between somatic motor neurons and autonomic motor neurons? Well, it's a rhetorical question. The answer is yes. And we talked about it on page F1. OK, let's look at the uh, bottom here, blood supply and nerve supply to a muscle. Well, we just described how there are blood vessels running within the fascia, the outer epimycium, the paramycium, and the endomycium. That provides the oxygen and nutrients to the skeletal muscle cells. The nerve supply, whenever we have sensory and motor neurons associated with a tissue, we use the word innervation. The word innervation obviously has the root nerve in it. It means to provide a nerve supply. So uh, running within this connective tissue are nerve fibers, both sensory and motor neurons. What is an example of a sensory neuron associated with our skeletal muscles? So one example of a sensory neuron associated with skeletal muscles are called proprioceptors. Now we have uh, sensory neurons typically have this ending, scepter or receptor. Among the sensory neurons found in our skin uh, include thermoreceptors and touch receptors pain sensory neurons called noxiceptors. So uh, one of the types of sensory neurons associated with a skeletal muscle are proprioceptors. Proprioceptors are associated with the sensation called proprioception. Proprioception is the same as kinesthesia. Oh, now you're thinking, oh, you've really helped me. Proprioception is the same as kinesthesia. Now I understand. OK, let's see if I can help you a little bit further. The word kinesthesia, what does kinesis mean? Movement. Movement. Do you remember us learning the words karyokinesis, cytokinesis? Kinesis means movement. I always tell you what these roots mean, because every time I tell you what a root means, you can bet a quadrillion dollars that root's going to keep reappearing. Kinesis means movement. Esthesia. Esthesia means sensation. And how you've heard that root, esthesia, before is anesthesia. What does it mean when you put the prefix a or an in front of a word? Without. Without. So anesthesia is, means you have no sensation. So kinesthesia is putting it together, the sensation of movement. That's what proprioception means. Now, even though I like the word kinesthesia, because I can break up the word and tell you exactly what it means, most books today use the word proprioception rather than kinesthesia. They mean the same thing. You, say, you still might say, I don't understand. 
Okay, let's try this. Wiggle your toes. Are you wiggling your toes? Can you feel them move? That's called proprioception. That's called kinesthesia, the sensation of movement. Can you tense the muscle in your thigh? Can you feel the muscle in your thigh tightening? That's called proprioception. That's called kinesthesia. That's a sensation. That has to do with uh, information about what your skeletal muscles are doing that is being sent as an input signal to your brain so that you feel the sensation of your toes wiggling or your muscles contracting. On page H4, somatic motor neurons, motor neurons we know are the neurons that activate, that control parts of our body. Somatic motor neurons are those motor neurons that permit voluntary activation, voluntary control of our skeletal muscles. Skeletal muscles. In contrast, we learned that autonomic motor neurons automatically control what? What do autonomic motor neurons automatically control? Internal organs, visceral organs. That's what we have learned on page F1. So here it has a picture of two somatic motor neurons originating in the spinal cord. These two somatic motor neurons are shown innervating or controlling a different group of skeletal muscle cells. Each somatic motor neuron typically synapses and therefore controls or activates hundreds, sometimes thousands, of individual skeletal muscle cells. Now we wrote that the somatic motor neuron and all of the skeletal muscle fibers or cells that it controls is called a motor unit. So what's a motor unit? A motor unit consists of the somatic motor neuron and all of the skeletal muscle cells it activates. Here's an analogy. I think of this, a motor unit is like the, the military term platoon. A platoon consists of a group of soldiers under the command of one officer. So uh, that officer commands a group of soldiers. The somatic motor neuron commands a group of skeletal muscle cells. So when a somatic motor neuron sends an electrical current called an AP, an action potential, when it sends that electrical current called an action potential, have we ever mentioned uh, this electrical current or action potential previously? Answer, yes, page H1 when we talked about excitability. We said that skeletal muscle exhibits excitability and contractility. And excitability is the capacity to generate an electrical current called an action potential. Page H1, we covered that. So uh, when it conducts this electrical signal, it activates all the skeletal muscle cells that that somatic motor neuron connects to or synapses onto. So this picture shows two different motor units. All right, now what's written uh, down here are uh, some other terms we need to know. What is an agonist? What is a synergist? What is an antagonist? The major muscle, the prime mover or agonist that causes flexion of the arm, that causes flexion of, at the elbow, is the biceps brachii. We had mentioned the biceps brachii on page H2 previously. So that's muscle number one, the biceps brachii. When it contracts, it pulls the radius of the forearm closer to the scapula. But is it the only muscle that causes flexion? No. We had actually mentioned on page H1, on H1, <coughs> we had mentioned the brachialis is a smaller muscle that also causes flexion. The brachialis pulls the ulna of the forearm closer to the humerus, and in so doing also causes flexion. We would say that the brachialis, which is smaller and less powerful than the biceps brachii, we would say that the brachialis is the asynergist. 
A synergist is a helper. The root syn, S-Y-N, means together. It works together with another muscle. So uh, the brachialis is a helper or synergist with the more powerful prime mover, the chief agonist, called the biceps brachii. Now, what is an antagonist? An antagonist is a muscle that has the opposite action of an agonist. Now, in this picture, if muscle number one is the biceps brachii, and it is uh, indicated on the legend right here at the right, then muscle number two is the triceps brachii. The triceps brachii, which is located on the back side of your arm, is the muscle that causes extension of the forearm, extension at the elbow. So uh, what is the major muscle, the main chief, the prime mover, the major agonist that causes flexion at the elbow? The biceps brachii. What is the muscle that has the opposite action of the biceps brachii? The triceps brachii. It is in the antagonist. And now, I could use those terms opposite. You'd say, what do you mean? I could say that the triceps brachii is the muscle that causes extension. So who is the antagonist of the triceps brachii? The biceps brachii. Antagonist, these are relative terms. The, the, whichever action I'm talking about, that's the agonist. And the action that is the opposite is the antagonist. So if I'm talking about flexion, Who's the agonist? The biceps brachii. Who's the antagonist? The triceps brachii. If I'm speaking of extension of the forearm, who's the major agonist? The triceps brachii. Who's the antagonist? The biceps brachii. One more term here, fixator. I don't use this term very much. Fixator just refers to muscles that stabilize the position of the body so that, for example, when we move our arms, or uh, we are commonly stabilizing our torso so that it doesn't move. Uh, if you're playing tug of war, right, with a rope, uh, you are pulling the rope with your arm muscles and you're using the muscles of your torso to stabilize you so that your body doesn't move. They're called fixators or stabilizers.